Hi, welcome to the Select Chicago 2020 virtual conference session, Rebuilding the Domestic Supply Chain. I'm Erin Jason, the Business Development Coordinator for the City of Elmhurst, Illinois, and I welcome you here to Elmhurst virtually um, in this COVID pandemic world. Situated on the Eastern Gateway of DuPage County, Elmhurst is located 16 miles west of Chicago, minutes from O'Hare Airport, and at the crossroads of key Illinois Expressway. This dynamic suburban city is home to more than 44,000 residents and 2,500 plus businesses. We're the proud corporate headquarters for many highly regarded enterprises, including but certainly not limited to Greenleaf Foods, Superior Ambulance, Semblex Corporation, and McMaster Car. Elmhurst is a historic tree-lined community with a wide variety of housing, offering those who live, work, and do business here a vibrant mix of the past and the future. Elmhurst enjoys thriving retail shopping centers, urban boutiques, excellent restaurants, a 10-screen movie theater, multiple automobile dealerships, and three business parks. Home to Elmhurst University and Edward Elmhurst, Elmhurst Hospital, we welcome you proudly to Elmhurst. Today with us as our keynote presentation, as I said, is rebuilding the domestic supply chain. Harry Mosier will be our keynote speaker. Harry founded the Reshoring Initiative in 2010 to bring manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. Hold on while I read his very impressive resume to you, and, or at least small pieces of it. Harry was inducted into the Industry Week Manufacturing Hall of Fame in 2010. He was named Quality Magazine's Quality Professional of the Year for 2012. In 2012, he also participated in President Obama's 2012 Insourcing Forum at the White House. He won the Economist debate on outsourcing and offshoring in 2013 and received the Manufacturing Leadership Council's Industry Advocacy Award in 2014. He is a regular guest on Fox Business, Market Watch, and other US TV and radio programs. Frequently quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, The New Yorker, and the USA Today, please help me welcome the premier voice and US advocate for reshoring and bringing back as much manufacturing as possible to the US, Mr. Harry Mosier. <laughs> Hi, thank, thank, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. It's clear? Okay, thank you. Well, it's, it's good to be back to Chicago. I, I lived for about 35 years in a combination of uh, Hinsdale, Lincolnshire, and Kildare and moved away a couple of years ago, but it's, my heart is still with you, so I'm, I'm happy to be back. Okay. And uh, so uh, I want to show some slides. So uh, we're, we're talking about the rebuilding the domestic supply chain. We're talking about how Illinois can bring some, not all, but some of what it imports back and produce it in Illinois or source it in Illinois rather than bring it in from somewhere else around the world. Next. So to give you a little background on me, I, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and the right across the river from New York City. And the biggest thing in town was Singer Sewing Machine. And at, in its heyday, maybe around 1910, the Singer factory was the largest manufacturing building in the world, 2.6 million square feet, 3,000, 5,000 employees, it was huge. My grandfather was a foreman, my dad ran a third of the factory. I worked there summers in high school and college. I went back 20 years ago and nothing for Singer is made there anymore. Everything's imported. And during my career, I sold uh, machine tools, foundry equipment, things like that and company after company, industry after industry that I sold to or wanted to sell to disappeared. The, the industries were wiped out, the companies were wiped out such that the, the US manufacturing significantly declined. Next. And so you can see here that the um, uh, US manufacturing the last 10, 15, 20 years has at best plateaued. You can see the 0.7% growth. Actually, I think if you measured by tons and piles of things, it's, it's actually gone down significantly. Uh, next. And as a result, manufacturing share of GDP is down 50% from maybe 27% of GDP to maybe 12. Next. But, but that's not because we're a services society. 
if you if you look at actual consumption of goods, personal consumer consumption of goods, they've grown at say two and a half percent per year, which is faster than the average growth of the GDP. So we're actually spending a bigger share of our expenditures on goods. The problem is that we're just not making enough of them anymore. Next. So the you can see here the trade deficit of the United States. So the, the difference between, or say the trade balance, the difference between what we export and what we import. And the trade balance was positive after the Second World War, strongly positive for a while. It got to neutral around 1980. And since then has essentially continuously declined. Here it's shown as percentage of the GDP, but out, out there the last five, three, four, five years, it's averaged about 800 billion, I repeat with a B, 800 billion dollars per year deficit. So that that deficit represents about 5 million manufacturing jobs at current levels of US productivity. So if we, if we when we balance a trade deficit, we'll have 5 million more manufacturing workers in the United States, which would be approximately a 40 percent increase. So just a huge amount. And, and Illinois should, should get its share of that increase. Next. So as a result of that decline, uh, manufacturing jobs as a percentage of U.S. employment have gone from maybe 27 percent to maybe eight or nine percent. So this the same kind of decline you see in, in manufacturing uh, or in the trade deficit. Next. In fact, if you put the two together, so I've got the blue line for employment, manufacturing employment as a percentage of the GDP, and the red line is the trade balance as a percentage of GDP, and you see they strongly correlate. So there's been a, you know, a, a, most of the decline in manufacturing employment has been due to the trade deficit, not as some of the media would portray to automation. Next. <clears throat> So why, why, why did this happen? Well, price. The, the companies didn't go offshore initially 20, 30 years ago because you could buy things in uh, China or, or Japan or Mexico that we couldn't buy here. They went there because the price was lower. And, and so we did a survey a couple of years ago with Plant Moran, one of the top uh, accounting and auditing and consulting companies with, with a strong presence in Chicago. and and we surveyed manufacturers and said, why do you import? And overwhelmingly, they said price. We go offshore for price, either directly because of price or because you can't find it here. Why can't you find it here? Because the low price from offshore drove the U.S. manufacturers out of business. So the offshoring is overwhelmingly due to price. Next. So why is the price? Why is the U.S. not price competitive? I broke it down into the three categories you can see here. Uh, from a macro viewpoint, uh, we've had uh, the dollar has appreciated about 300 percent in the last 40 years against our major trading partners. As a result, our wages, our costs in general, are higher than they would otherwise be. You know, China was brought into the World Trade Organization and people said, well, we're going to open China to the world. Well, really, we opened the world to China. You know, we, we turned out to be the prey in China was the predator, very aggressively, very successfully, very clever, cleverly you know, uh, expanded their manufacturing, automated, marketed, and took you know, huge amounts of jobs out of the U.S., as had other countries previously. Uh, consumers demand the lowest price product, and therefore the companies go out and find the lowest price product, which they found offshore too often. Uh, consumers have their kids choosing to go to university and not into apprentice programs and training programs like TMA in Chicago, excellent apprentice programs. Most of the time, most of the time they, they, I think they'd love to have more apprentices. And, and of those who go to university, too many study uh, liberal arts instead of engineering. Companies bear a lot of the blame. U.S. companies are known for being very short-term oriented. They, um, we invest about a third as much in CNC machine tools as the Chinese. And we have a third as many robots per thousand manufacturing workers as the South Koreans. So we have the higher wages. We're the ones where 
automation should pay off, but we don't do it. As a result, we're not competitive. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, TCO, total cost of ownership, is the method to uh, better make sourcing decisions more accurately. And most companies don't do that. I'll, I'll give you more detail on that as we go ahead. Next. So fortunately, the, the balance has started to restore. I'll give you some, some data on that. We talk about reshoring done by a U.S. company. Think, for example, General Motors, and uh, also called onshoring. And it's all about bringing the work back that will be sold here. So we, we don't say we should make everything here and sell Barbie dolls to China. We know that's not going to happen, but we should make more of what we consume here. Um, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, is foreign companies investing in a country. And it's that would be, for example, Toyota. And it follows exactly the same logic the company wants to produce in the market. Localization means the same thing. People talk about nearshoring. So nearshoring would be to take something that's de destined for the U.S. market to be sold here, and now it's made somewhere far away, like China or India, and bring it back and produce it in Mexico or Canada. And and my preference is to get it to the U.S. But if you can, if it's so labor intensive that it only that you can get it to Mexico but not the U.S., then I'd rather have it in Mexico than China, because product coming out of Mexico has a 40, that's 40% 40 U.S. content, whereas product out of China has a 5% U.S. content. So I'm not here to advocate for Mexico, but to say it's a it's a viable alternative. Next. So as a result of this trend that I'm describing, global trade has slowed. So, uh, people track global trade, uh, dollar value as a percentage of uh, uh, each year, dollar growth each year. And it used to grow at about 5% a year. And then it slowed down in 2017, slowed down more in 2018, actually went negative in 2019, even before the COVID crisis. So it's clear that, that the world is starting to understand that putting things in crates and shipping them around the, around the world doesn't bring value to the customer. Next. So the OECD, you know, very credible organization on the on their trade topic, they've seen a correlation between automation and offshoring. So when companies when countries automate, then the high wage countries that automate are able to compete with the low wage countries, and therefore reshoring happens. So we see that happening. It's happening here, not as fast as I'd like. Next. So very very welcoming event. Um, many of you should know of the Business Roundtable. It's an association of the, the top CEOs in the country. And 181 of them in August of 2019 signed a, a statement on the purpose of a corporation. And until that time, it was generally believed or accepted that the only obligation was to the shareholder. But in, in August of last year, these top people, you can recognize many of the people there, these top CEOs said, no, it's not just the shareholder, it's also the community, the supplier, and the employee. And you know, how better for them to actually walk the talk than to bring back a portion of what they've offshored and strengthen the Illinois community, the Illinois supplier, the Illinois employee. And, and as I'll show you, they can in many cases do that and actually increase profitability. Next. So to, to put the, the quantify the trend a bit, you can see here uh, back around, we, we, we put together FDI, foreign direct investment and reshoring. I, I described them before. And back around 2010, the total of those two trends was about 6,000 manufacturing jobs a year. And by 2017, that had gone up to 190,000, so about 30 times as high as and then it fell and, and it happened, you know, the, the, the last surge there in 2017 happened primarily because of the uh, Trump uh, corporate tax reductions and regulatory reductions. But then with the trade war that started or, or that we started to fight in, the, uh, the rate of reshoring and FDI fell off in 2018 and 2019. And now it's reshoring at least has started to pick up in 2020. Next. So one reason for things generally coming back has been the 
rise in labor costs in China. So this chart shows indexed unit labor costs expressed in dollars in manufacturing in a variety of countries. So index means whatever the cost was of making a certain thing and just the labor cost in the year 2000, call it 100, so we can see the change since then. And adjusting each year for the change in wage rate, the change in productivity, and the change in currency, we see the U.S. has been flat. Labor cost to make a thing has stayed about the same. Other countries bounce around a bit. The outlier in blue is China, and that's now at 500. So they're, the labor content of the things they make is now five times as high as it was 20 years ago. And now it was almost nothing 20 years ago, so it's still not huge, but it's at least measurable now. And so some of the companies that thought it correctly thought it was wonderfully profitable to move the work to China 20 years ago. Now it's not so clear. Now, even before COVID, even before the trade wars, work was starting to come out of China because China is no longer the the uh, perfect solution for manufacturing. Next. Now, other reasons for things coming back, uh, starting in the upper left-hand corner, e-commerce. You know, when you order something through e-commerce, you expect it today or tomorrow. And if there's a surge in order, like we've seen, you know, especially during the last six months, then the distribution center runs out. And when they run out, they need to be restocked. And if restocking has to come by surface from uh, Asia, that's weeks or months to get it replenished. It's not going to happen. Whereas if it's coming from your factory uh, 100 miles away, in, in principle, you can restock them in a day or two days. Automation obviously helps to uh, take away some of the extra cost of high price labor because you don't need as much of it with automation. The Trump tariffs, you know, like them or hate them, they uh, have made product from China more expensive. Uh, made in USA, survey after survey shows consumers increasingly reject the Chinese solution and, and pick the American solution. A Deming, that's the picture you see here, he's the father of quality. His work helped lean, the whole lean effort has helped. And I'll mention China often in this because China has had the, they've been the big gorilla in terms of offshoring. And they've also been the source of 40 or 50% of the reshoring. So it's, the, it's, a, it's a logical place to uh, pursue opportunities. Next. So then everything was going along, sort of progress. And then we had COVID. And we went from, from people having a sort of an intellectual understanding of the trade deficit during the trade war to having an emotional reaction, fear of losing your job, fear of dying, fear of losing family members, the collapse of society, all this stuff that, that, that to a certain extent happened. And, and, and this has now caused action. Next. So we've seen uh, surveys of companies. Th this data is from ThomasNet, the people who put out the, like they used to do the Thomas Register. Now it's online, ThomasNet. And, and they've seen month after month as the crisis developed, companies deciding to, to shift their uh, sourcing out of China and significantly back to the United States. Next. So co companies have seen that the long supply chains that you see here are too risky, and they've decided to mitigate that risk. So they, they've seen they've, the, the Chinese uh, crisis, the COVID crisis, um, reminded them of the Japanese tsunami, the Fukushima, the, the Thai floods, the uh, Iceland volcano that stopped air freight from coming in from Europe, the uh, LA dock strike. So there's, if, if you have a lot of supply chains stretched around the world, I heard an MIT expert say, you should expect that at least one of them each year will be significantly impacted by something, whether it's you know, plague or it's uh, uh, natural disaster or it strikes, it's war, it's some, something's going to go wrong. And so next, what we recommend and what some companies are choosing to do is if their assembly plan is in the U.S. to move more of their suppliers, especially of critical components, to near the assembly plants. And to me, near, if your assembly plants in uh, uh, 
you know, Elmhurst, we did put, put get as many of the suppliers as you could in Elmhurst. And, but at least at least within the United States or within North America. So you don't have all the all the, the risks that, that, are, we've sh that I was showing you on the other slide. So getting getting as close as you can to that main facility. So you only have one risk. You know, if the asteroid comes in and takes out Elmhurst, well, it takes out the suppliers, but it takes out your assembly plant too, so it doesn't matter that you lost the suppliers. Next. So uh, as I said, companies tend to look only at the price and they don't look at total cost. So they say the U.S. is too expensive. I can't afford to come back. I'd love to come back. I'd love to have a made in USA product. I'd love to take away that risk, but it's too expensive here. And we say, no, that's not consistently right. Uh, and because most companies, about 60 percent, look only at the wage rate or maybe the X works price or the FOB price, maybe the landed cost. And as such, in, instead of looking at the total cost, they're missing somewhere between 10 and 20% of all the costs. And therefore, often they're making the wrong decision where they put their factories and where they buy their components. Next. So we, we, are, we provide online on our website. Uh, www.reshorenow.org, uh, the total cost of ownership estimator, which has been online for about 10 years and thousands of people have used it. And it helps the companies to make that decision more accurately. So you can see here a case, the red dot is the uh, Chinese price, the FOB price at, at 70 and the US was at 100. So the purchasing person, the procurement person, looks at this and says, wow, $30 difference, 30% difference. Uh, I'm going to buy 12,000 of those a year. That's $360,000 of purchase price variance. Of course, I'll send that off to be made in China. That's, that's a third of my objective. I'm going to make my bonus. Of course, that's good. But when they did total cost of ownership, they saw the Chinese was 98, US was 108. So now it's only a 10% difference. And assuming that the wage rates in both countries continued at the historic levels, the Chinese TCO in two or three years would be higher than the U.S. So hopefully the company would be smart enough to say, well, let's, let's not send these new ones off because once they're there, it's hard to bring back. And, and let's start planning to bring back much of what's over there and expanding, hiring, training, finding local suppliers so we'll be more profitable and more stable. Next. So to show you the power of this, I took the first 180 cases of where the users compared China to the US. And the blue curve shows the distribution, the histogram of uh, China price as a percentage of US price. So at 100, the two are equal. And the, the mode, the peak of the blue curve is around 70. So you might say on average, China price is about 70% of U.S. price at the factory. But when we switch the total cost and we include the total cost factors, the curve shifts to the right and the peak is around 85. And if there happens to be a, a Trump 15% tariff in place, then the peak shifts to about 98% of the U.S. And so as those shifts occur, the percentage of the part of the product where the uh, China price or TCO is above the U.S. is what is the number that's uh, below the curve to the right of the 100% line. So you go from 8% to 32% up to 46% as you do the correct measurement and and end if the Trump tariff happens to be in place. So, so a big difference between looking only at price and looking at total costs. Next. So what, what are these total costs that Harry's talking about so much? Well, I break them down between the hard uh, hard sort of real money costs like freight cost, uh, normal duty, uh, travel costs to go check on the supplier, the packaging, you need more packaging when it's going to be in a boat for uh, a month, um, the, the ability to deliver just in time and put the product on the factory floor instead of having to put it on the shelf and take it off the shelf, which happens when you get a container with two months or three months worth of inventory at one time. 
Um, then there's the risks and strategic impacts, the, the risk of emergency air freight. There was a lot of stuff being emergency air freighted here because we needed it so badly during the crisis. The, um, the ability of engineering and manufacturing to get together and communicate to optimize the product in the process, the value of made in USA, reducing the risk of stocking out or of intellectual property theft. Next. So how, how large, again, are those costs? Numerous surveys have been done and consistently come out with somewhere between 15 and 25%. So any company that's consistently ignoring those costs is obviously often making the, the, the wrong decision. Next. So the, this TCO, total cost of ownership, free, is available for two purposes. For the OEMs, the bigger companies, to buy and site, in other words, locate factories smarter, but for the suppliers, the people that sell to them here, to sell smarter, to convince them to buy from the supplier. Next. So as an example, here's an Illinois company, Mori Corp. They're in Woodridge, Illinois. They make printed circuit boards and other electronic uh, uh, devices. And they came to me five years ago, and they were worried about losing an order. So I worked with the VP of sales and uh, did the TCO calculation from the perspective of the customer. And the VP took it into that customer and he, he wrote to me and said that, that you, using TCO was the key to winning a $60 million order by helping the customer see the total cost instead of just the price. So, you know, I encourage all of you uh, for whom this might be relevant to take advantage of this tool. Thank you. Uh, next. So there's some more cases here of made in, uh, of reshoring in Illinois. Uh, let's just go through these quickly. You can just see them. And I think you'll be able to get to these later. Next. Right. A variety of reasons, automation, quality, what have you. Next. Yeah. Furniture kind of thing you th you'd think we'd lost, but that has come back next. Yeah. Plastic coloring. Next. Bicycles. You know, we've lost largely lost bicycles. And yet there's a, there's a number of companies bringing bicycles back to the U.S. Next. A, a very strong traditional U.S. company, uh, Bison, uh, making electrical motors. Next. Okay, so if you're in a company, either your own company or a, a customer company, and you want to get them started thinking about this, I, I ask them, I don't come in and pound the table and say, you've got to bring the work back. I say, it's in your own interest and, and the interest of Illinois and your community and the country to reevaluate and see if some of the work makes sense to bring back. And then once you've done the evaluation, then decide what to reshore. And so... Now, I, and I don't pick random parts. I would suggest they start with products that cause pain, so products where they're losing orders because of delivery, where they're having quality issues, where they have uh, too much travel before the crisis, uh, where they're up at midnight making telephone calls to, to someplace halfway around the globe. Uh, you know, any one of the issues that I show here. So you find cases where they have problems and issues, and then you can bring together the team to support you because the, the members of the team want to get rid of that pain. They want they want that irritation to go away. Next. So uh, we set priorities. We would say, for, if, I, if I were running, a, if I brought in to run a company and they said, well, Harry, okay, what, what should we do? Well, first do not offshore anything without doing TCO because once you've offshored it, now you've got to get it back. There's a transitional cost. Uh, I would then, uh, reshore outsourced products. The so products you've outsourced to independent companies, third parties, machine shops, foundries, you know, whatever it is, offshore, it's easier to pull the work out of them and move it back here than it is to shut down your own factory offshore. Third, you've got a factory offshore and it's supplying, let's say, half to the US and half into Asia. Over five years, repurpose it so it's 90% into Asia and then put your incremental investments here in the U.S. to produce the portion that used to come out of China or India or wherever it is. And then the toughest thing we recognize is you just built a $100 million factory somewhere, some other country, 
and I come in and tell you to shut it down and build a 150 million factory in the U.S. That's not going to happen. So that's the lowest priority, and and the, and the least economic. Next. So often inside the companies, there's a silo problem. The, the companies have um, the procurement see often, too often, sees their objective as to minimize purchase price. And they're measured on that in, in way too many cases. They're rewarded based on that. I've heard of salesmen coming in and saying, I'd like to sell you widgets. And, and they say, well, you'd have to match the China price. And the salesman said, well, I heard you're having quality issues and warranty issues because of and delivery issues from your offshore source. And they, uh, I measure on price. Uh, the, all those issues are in somebody else's budget. So if you run into that situation, then you have to go around them and talk to the people in quality, in sales and marketing, in manufacturing, pe people who are suffering the pain while, while procurement's getting the reward and get them to either convince procurement or convince general management to change the uh, objectives for procurement so that they will consider the needs of the company instead of just the needs of, of lower price. Next. So for, for, for the country, um, we see bringing back manufacturing jobs and the, the, the only way, to, the basic way to bring back manufacturing jobs is, is reshoring as the best solution to our biggest problem. So, you know, if you think of the headlines and the and the you know the disasters we've seen over the last year, um, disadvantaged inner city populations. Uh, as an example, I I saw a TV interview once with a I think a Chicago area gang member, young fella, and they asked him what would it have taken you to keep you out of the gang. He said twelve dollars an hour. You know, and I thought, huh, that that's that's probably less than they're starting the apprentices at around Chicago. So, and they're looking for apprentices. So what an opportunity that could have been. The opioid epidemic, especially in rural areas, maybe maybe more amongst the white population, uh, companies pulled out of the rural community and we've had depression and, and the opioid problem. Um, as, as a result of uh, the COVID crisis, general unemployment specifically, I, I expect 2 million, 4 million unemployed eventually in retail because of the we have too much retail. And so we're going to wind up with strip malls in communities near potential employees. So why not take those strip malls and convert them into small, into machine shops, into, uh, you know, wire harness makers, into, you know, apparel makers, into something that would allow those uh, citizens to have a good job close to their home and, and we reduce the trade deficit. And finally, with right now it looks like three trillion or something like that deficit this year and so we need to cut the spending and raise tax revenue the best way to do all that is more jobs especially well-paid manufacturing jobs so, so we see reshoring millions of jobs reshored over some period of time as solving the most important problems in the country next additional reasons uh, it, it, hard, it has been hard to recruit a skilled manufacturing workforce. Everybody wants to go to university. And, and, and partially that's because they saw manufacturing going offshore. And so as they see manufacturing coming back, as they see reshoring happening, it will be easier to recruit the skilled workforce that we need. Uh, everybody's concerned about uh, global warming, pollution, et cetera. And what we, we did a study of an aluminum die casting produced in China, shipped here versus produced here and, and because of the shipment, but even more so because their electricity production is so much dirtier than ours with a lot of dirty coal. You reduce the uh, greenhouse emissions by somewhere between 25 and 50 percent just by producing it here instead of producing it there. Um, so we, we're, we're confident that you can have both significant increases in productivity, which is what's necessary to raise wages and increase manufacturing employment by drawing down that 40% of the work that we've lost to offshore. Next. So we proposed, we proposed to the federal government a program that I'll very take you, quickly take you through here. So we identify a series of policy actions that could be taken. And I always start with skilled workforce because in any plan for increasing manufacturing, it's the key. 
and we should have apprentice programs like Germany and Switzerland. And uh, and I believe we'd cut the price of our products by at least 5%, maybe more, if we had that quantity and quality of training. I'd like to see a good value added tax or a border adjustment tax like most of the rest of the world has. The dollar down by maybe 20%. I believe you could do that and have minimal impact on inflation now, especially now when the Fed is trying to get a little more inflation. Um, a series of actions we could see 100% use of TCO, I think, would cut U.S. prices by the perceived price by at least 10%. So if you look at all these things and you add them up, you come up with ways, different methodologies by which you could cut U.S. price by 50% relative to the rest of the world. Next. And so this chart shows uh, in the in the center, like the third column, is is that percent is the percentage price reduced anywhere from ten percent reduced to thirty percent, and in the left hand column is the um, percentage reduction that would occur in the trade deficit, and the second column is the number of manufacturing jobs that would be brought back. So my, our our proposal is for the government, whether it's Trump or it's Biden, whoever it is, to Pick from those policies, any 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 other policies that they think might work. Pick policies that would help the U.S. be price competitive enough to bring back a substantial amount of this work. Now you can't do it all at once. If you, as I've shown in the right-hand column, it'll take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to make this happen, just like it's taken 40 or 50 years for the work to go away. Thank you. Uh, next. So uh, things that we offer that can help with this, we have the TCO estimator. I've told you about that. Again, it's free online. All you have to do is sign up for it and sign in. Um, and then we, we, we can help OEMs make their sourcing decisions smarter. We can help suppliers replace imports at the OEMs in Illinois or in the country. Uh, we have a, something called the Supply Chain Gap Program where we have identified the biggest supply chain gaps, things like gloves and masks and gowns, all this stuff we've heard about, but also you know, rare earth minerals and 5G and you know various kinds of devices that we essentially don't produce here, but we do import a lot of. And we work through um, MEPs, that's Manufacturing Extension Partnerships, Economic Developers, uh, Equipment Suppliers, various groups to make all this happen. Uh, there's loan money available from the uh, Development Finance Corporation in DC, specifically to uh, motivate and enable reshoring. Next. So uh, the, the probably the most popular of these programs that we call the import substitution program. And on that, what happens there, say you're a company in Illinois and, and you make a widget, you make some thing, whatever it is, you're, you're really good at making widgets. And then we would tell you who the biggest importers of widgets are, what quantity they're bringing in, some idea what they're paying it for them, whom they're buying them from offshore. And then we train you to use the TCO estimator to sell the widgets to those suppliers that we've identified. And then when you convince them to buy from you, you've reshored, they've reshored, and I get closer to my 5 million job goal to bring back to the country. Next. So the, this project is going very nicely. We're, we're underway in Cleveland, Dayton, and Maryland, and most aggressively in Illinois. So the, the MEP in Illinois is called IMEC. You can see I-M-E-C. And they've done a great job in general in Illinois. And they're the most aggressive group in the country that's helping us work with companies to bring the manufacturing back. And so uh, I encourage you to look them up and give them a call and tell them you'd like to play. Next. So we also, uh, for a foreign direct investment perspective, uh, I, along with uh, uh, Michelle Comerford from uh, Biggins Lacey Shapiro, did an article in FBI Intelligence. And this, this chart and the next chart uh, summarized the methodology we use to compare, for say, a, uh, a German company that has that wants to sell more in the U.S., how they would go about deciding, should we expand our German factory, where we have our people now? Should we uh, put a factory in China where the labor is cheap and ship from there to the U.S.? 
or should we put the factory in the U.S. where the labor's high, about like Germany, but where, and where we're not yet, but where uh, you'd be producing right in the market. And I, we, we went through the methodologies and how you, you next slide, how you can um, decide in, in which cases the what the ROI would be for each of those alternatives. And the ROI depends very much on the nature of the product, uh, shipping costs, uh, technology, all kinds of things. Labor intensivity would make it make a big difference. Next. So you know, finally, you know, I've taken a lot of detail, a lot of methodology, but finally it comes down to what your strategy is. So if your strategy is we're going to sell the product at the lowest possible price, despite everything I've said, probably offshore is, is the right solution. You know, whether it's China or Mexico, that's a different question. But but if if you if if price is your is your focus, probably offshore. Next. But if you're if you're concerned about fastest delivery to the market, if you're about quality, uh, if you want to have the leading technology, if you want to protect your intellectual property, if, you, if those things collectively are more important to you than, than having the lowest price, then domestic is at least worth evaluating and probably is, is the right solution. Next. So we're a, a nonprofit uh, incorporated actually in Illinois. Uh, we were blessed with strong support from Groups like you see here. So a AMT is is the uh, group that normally puts on IMTS in this week, uh, the big machine tool show. Uh, DGS is a marketing company that's helped us. Uh, Gardner puts out Modern Machine Shop and I know, maybe a dozen other manufacturing magazines. Excellent, excellent group. Uh, other AFS is an Illinois-based uh, uh, American Foundry Society, and uh, uh, Big Kaiser. Is, is located, you know, so you've got lots, lots of Illinois there, and and you, Illinois has been very, very good to us over the years. Next, so this is how we think of ourselves as the, the little Dutch boy uh, putting his finger in the dike, holding back the North Sea, and, uh, and on the other side of the dike, that's offshoring, and the little guy is is Harry when Harry had hair, and uh, and conceptually, you're the village elders, and if you if you say, Harry, that's nice to, to listen to, good luck, then probably things don't get much better. But if you if you listened and if you apply total cost and you reevaluate and you invest in the U.S. and in the skilled workforce, then then much more manufacturing will come back and the U.S. will be a, a better, more stable place for you and your children and grandchildren, which is, which is why I'm doing it. So uh, I'm open, open to questions now. Thank you so much, Harry. You've shared such a volume of information in a short period of time. I was really, and I just ate lunch, so usually I'd be like getting a little tired, and I've been zoomed in listening to every word, so thank you. We do have some questions to get you going, um, and if anyone else has questions, we have some questions who have come in through the portal. Um, I encourage others who have been listening to the presentation to share your questions direct um, through the portal, and Cassandra will get them to me to ask. So kicking us off, Harry, um, you discussed the correlation between automation and reshoring. If we have to automate to reshore, will automation increase or decrease the number of U.S. jobs? Yeah. It, it, it. I've quoted I, a couple of times I've written in articles that we will lose more jobs to Chinese automation if we do not automate than we will to U.S. automation if we do. So if we don't, so we've, we've been, U.S. has been increasing productivity over the last 12 years at an average of 0.4% per year. So less than half a percent per year. And the Chinese have been increasing at six or 7% a year. So that, that's why they've been able to dramatically increase their wage rates, and we and we have not been able to. So, so if we they continue to increase productivity and, and we don't, we stay flat, then our costs are not going to improve versus theirs, and we'll continue to lose work to them. Whereas if we get our productivity going up dramatically, then we can be more price competitive. We can bring the work back, and I, and I believe and I, my numbers say that we can have both increased productivity, which means moderately higher wage rates than otherwise, and bring more jobs. Because there's these 5 million, think of it as a as an insurance policy, 5 million jobs that are now offshore that we can bring back as we become competitive. 
So along those same lines, Harry, um, regarding the correlation between automation and reshoring, how does that affect the skilled workforce availability? I know you said it brings approximately 5 million jobs back to the U.S., but what does that do to workforce avail availability here? Certainly, as, as you automate, uh, you tend to get rid of the lowest level jobs, the, you know, the people, person who just takes it apart and puts it in a machine or moves it from here to here. You get rid of many of those lowest level jobs but, but, and you need more of the programmer, more of the machine maintainer, more of the, uh, the, the, the robot the designer, all these automation design, these kind of things. On the other hand, if you bring back 40% increase in manufacturing, you might need as many of those lowest level jobs as we still have today. Because even if it's a smaller percentage of the pie, if the pie is 40% bigger, there could still be as many. So, so therefore, I, I, I believe you can have both automation, more jobs, many more high-level jobs, but, but still have jobs available for the people who do not, who cannot be convinced to obtain the skills to be the robot programmer. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, what has been the impact of productivity on reshoring? Uh, we analyze, uh, we, we have thousands of cases of companies that have reshored, such, such as the ones where I put up the slides today. And the productivity uh, is the number one or the number two reason that they give for bringing the work back. So, so they don't, uh, the idea is not, let's say you were an Illinois company and 20 years ago you sent the work off to China. Or, or somewhere, Japan. So, and, and now you want to bring it back. Well, you don't bring it back, put it in the same factory with the same tools and the same methods and same everything as you did it 20 years ago. You, it, you bring it back like uh, any of you who know Lean, uh, the, the, the sort of the guru of Lean these days is Jim Womack. He's, he's a neighbor of mine now. And, and he talks about lean shoring. So when you bring the work back, bring it back, lean, bring it back with a better factory design, bring it back with more automation, bring it back with better training. And at first, that enables you to bring it back because you're more competitive. And second, it's, it's a better work environment, a better job for the people that, that you do have in your factories. So you mentioned lean, Harry. Can you tell us more what is the role of lean? Oh, uh, everybody has a different definition, and I, I'm not the world expert on lean. Uh, the, the role of lean, as I see it, is to... Uh, stop doing things that do not bring value to the customer. So what a co company, a company could be a factory, could be a hospital. You, you look at all your people and say, what do you do? Okay. Which one of those things actually bring value to the customer or, or to your, your coworkers so they can bring value to the customer. And, and if you're doing something that doesn't achieve that, or that's way down on the scale here, we'll do more of the things that bring significant value to the customer and do less of the things down here that, that, that do not. Now, people use the Toyota production system to do that. Uh, that has a, a list of seven wastes or muda. And then I have a chart I didn't happen to bring up that shows for each of those muda how offshoring makes, makes the waste worse. More inventory, more travel, more transportation, more, uh, you know, less quality, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, uh, it's, it's lean. Now, but other people would approach it in a different way. There's dozens of ways. Like one of the most popular methods is, is walking the gemba. So you go out and you walk. The gemba is the place where the work's actually done. So the lean expert would go out and walk where the work, not, not sit in the office and talk about it, but go out and look, look and see what's actually being done. Talk to the people that are actually doing it. Talk to them about how it could be done more effectively, more efficiently, with less waste, more value for the customer. Great. Thank you. Um, now, this is a question we got from uh, one of our viewers. How can Chicago municipalities use this information to support local manufacturers, um, especially those impacted by tariffs? Okay. Uh, the, 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 from a self-serving position, um, we offer the import substitution program and the supply chain gap program and, and other programs. You know, they, they can work with us and with IMEC. I mean, I, IMEC's there. They're, they're spending money 
to have us help Illinois companies to, uh, reevaluate off, offshoring internally in their company or, re or, or find opportunities to sell to companies that are now important. So, so I say the simple thing is call I'm at they've retained us to help you achieve do exactly what what the, what the writer just just described. Um, and, but and if for some reason someone's outside of Illinois that's listening and, and wants that help, then you, you contact contact me uh, directly and and we, we can provide that. So, but so that that's sort of going directly at the problem. Here's an opportunity to make some reshoring happen. In the long run, you need the better skilled workforce. You need, you need to shift, reallocate resources from um, some of the academic programs to, to more uh, training programs, more tool maker, more welder, more, you know, because that, that's where the shortages are. And, and, that's, and if you don't have those skilled workforces, the companies will not relocate or will not expand in your community. So along those similar lines, Harry, um, we economic developers, you know, my colleagues across the Chicagoland region, which we're considering a 300, mi 300 kilometer uh, region from Metro Chicago, so including some of Wisconsin, Indiana, et cetera, um, as well as our select Chicago partners who are looking to bring foreign direct investment here to this region. How do they get started? I know you, you somewhat touched on that with the last question, but how should they go about getting started with reshoring or bringing their manufacturing to the U.S.? You, you mentioned foreign direct investment. Um, so we had, I, I very briefly mentioned our supply chain gaps program. So we, we've done some really good analysis from Commerce Department and other data, and we know what the biggest supply chain gaps are. So where there's say $100 million being imported and nothing being produced here, or almost nothing being produced here. So U.S. is very dependent on the imports. So that's an opportunity for a company to be the only U.S. supplier of that product category. So we, we, we have that list. And so the, uh, the, the, we can, a community or a state, a county, we can tell them who, who, where those gaps are and they can pick the ones that make sense for them like probably not pineapples and probably not, uh, uh, you know, oranges here in Illinois. And, but so things that make sense. And then we can tell them who the biggest foreign suppliers are, the companies that are shipping in that $100 million a year. Okay. And then they, the community or the state goes to those foreign suppliers and says, Mr. Wang Zhu, you're, you've got 10% of the U.S. market. Nobody's making those in the U.S., how about putting a factory here in Elmhurst and be the only U.S. supplier? And now maybe you're going to get 30 or 40 percent. But I, I encourage you to do that. But if you don't want to do it, that's OK. I'll go to your competitor down the street and I'll get them to do it. And then he's going to kick you out of the market. So let's get going and get the factory going. <laughs> Fair enough. I was at a conference a few years ago where I think they said, um, if you wanted a ball bearing, good luck. You can't find that in the U.S. anymore. So it's it's great to hear people talking about bringing these um, vital resources for our business community back to the U.S. So, Harry, I have, I have one kind of final question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. We used to make everything here, say, 40 years ago, and gradually we got hollowed out as the work got pulled to Japan, to South Korea, to, to China. And... And, and we still have the basic technology. We've got the engineers. We've got, you know, University of Illinois and so on. So there's no reason in a reasonable period of time we, we can't bring it back. But having the foreign company bring it back, bringing in their current technology, doing FDI, is an excellent way to get it done. Well, thank you so much, Harry. I've, like, as I was saying, I have one final question for you. And I think you've told us the answer um, through all of your answers to all of our questions. If we have more questions, whom should we call? <laughs> Ghostbusters, Harry Moser, right right here. Uh, you fi find our website, uh, reshorenow.org. It's got the phone number, email, whatever. Just call me and ask for some help. Again, Harry, thank you so much for sharing all of your great knowledge with us on reshoring and learning more about the reshoring initiative. Um, I encourage you to utilize Harry's contact information that he shared on his slideshow. Check out his website. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Select Chicago viewers. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.